Sweet. There we go. All right. So guys, it's uh, week eight. This is the last week of training. Uh, and here we're going to kind of sum together a lot of what you've learned over the last few weeks um, in kind of a, a simulated machining environment. Uh, so this week, applying the machining practices you've learned, we're going to make this part. Um, this the standard. Cool. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's it's a BattleBots part, um, classic like aluminum, um, everything done in the CMA. What's, what's CMA again? Uh, the oh, what does that stand common, for? Common machining area. It's what there all we go. teams use. Um, but yeah, all, all the big machines in there does all the heavy lifting. But yeah, so we're going to review what the machines are which you learned back in week five, drawings and how to read them and apply them uh, in practice. Um, tooling, right? So we've got these big machines, but really um, the most important part is the last however many inches of the machining process, putting the correct tools in those machines uh, to get the desired result. And then the different operations, right? So how you use the machine will give you different results on your part. The paramount to it all is safety, right? We have access to these really cool uh, machines and resources, um, and it's it's we have a lot of freedom in what we can do, but it's on the caveat that we are always safe and we're not doing dumb stuff in the CMA, right? Always wearing eye protection, closed toe shoes, long pants. Um, they're suggested, not required. Uh, sleeves, always make sure your sleeves are rolled up. I always see this in the shop. Um, if you get a long sleeve, it's kind of cold out. You're going to want to you want to keep it rolled down, but really that fabric down by your your wrist uh, could prove to be really dangerous for some of these machines. So always always make sure to roll it up if you wear long sleeves, or um, if you can, just don't wear long sleeves to the shop. Uh, if you got long hair, make sure to tie that back. Any of these like loose, uh, dangly like parts of your attire, whether it's like the drawstrings on your hoodie, anything that's not like really tightly strapped down, that could be a, a safety hazard. Um, you can imagine these machines that are spinning very rapidly. Uh, if anything gets caught in that, you're having a bad time. Um, gloves, you'll see in this picture here, the guy's wearing a glove while he's using that press. Um, you actually don't want to use gloves for an operation like that. Uh, gloves are a kind of situational uh, safety item, depending on what machine you're using. Um, and then, of course, no horseplay. Um, it, it would be kind of dumb if you showed up, followed all the safety rules, and then someone's in there playing ninja in the shop and knocks into the machine. Like, let's be serious here and um, show up, get your work done, you know? And then, uh, you haven't seen the CMA yet, but we don't do wood machining in the common space. Uh, just because I believe what I was told was uh, like the wood particulates um, is a fire hazard, right? So we only do metal machining in there. The CMA and SUMS. Uh, so SUMS is the system that keeps track of who is using what machine in the shop. Uh, we want to always be accountable for who's doing what in there. Uh, if you show up and use um, What's the one of the names? The the Vectrax mill. Um, I want to be able to see in the system, hey, XYZ showed up at 2 p.m. and used the Vectrax from 2 to 4. So if something's messy at 4.30 or if something's broken, um, we have accountability for who's using what. I believe most of the machines won't even let you turn them on unless a person has registered that, hey, I'm using the machine and a second person has registered as a buddy for that machine. Because uh, we always want two people at a machine. One person's doing the operations. The other person is over overseeing it. And uh, if something goes wrong, there's always a big red button to hit uh, and turn off all the all the machinery and possibly save someone's um, life or prevent some serious injury. So yeah, always want two people per machine in the CMA recording the sums. So getting back to the part, um, we have this end goal, this 
abstract idea of a, a design for our side plate. Um, but how we actually realize that with aluminum, uh, you kind of have to critically think about uh, when you're handed a, uh, a drawing. So we're going to get started on this. Um, this is where we're going to get really interactive here is I'm going to show you this drawing uh, that supposedly your mech league has your mech lead has handed you and said, hey, we're going to make this part today. Um, and then you'll go through figuring out what you want to do to actually make this a reality. <coughs> so without further ado, here is the drawing. Um, so you can see on the bottom there is kind of a, a top down view. You can see the, the whitest face of it. Um, and at first glance, it may seem a little daunting uh, because it really is. It's pretty Spartan. Uh, it does not do a lot graphically to make it pretty. Uh, it's just the bare minimum of what you need to know to make the part. Um, some things to point out here is, for instance, uh, you'll see some of the holes, right? There'll be an arrow pointing at it. You can see something like a, uh, a bar with a down arrow, right? That's a through hole or that's a um, that's a hole that passes through the entirety of the part um, rather than if you're looking at um, the top or bottom of that wide view, you can see the dotted outline of a hole going into the part uh, where it only goes a certain depth. So, uh, no, the line with the arrow is a blind hole. I think it's it a be, blind hole. Uh, normally it is. It looks like in this case they are used for through holes, but that's like uh, on the front on the front view they are used for through holes, but that's unnecessary unless there's one. Normally, if that's that's for depth of a blind hole, but okay, okay, yeah, that's true. It looks confusing. I'm yeah, sorry. I just I've I've mostly learned this through doing it so i don't know like the, all the applications these could be yeah. used for so yeah feel free to chime in and correct me if i say something wrong um oh i feel free <laughs> <laughs> yeah both, both of you are right the the depth indicator usually indicates a blind hole but it is used for throw through holes here as well okay because of course it is <laughs> I wouldn't. um so actually yeah let me let me turn it over to you guys um so I guess we can use the raise hand thing if it becomes a problem, but uh, just anyone speak up and um, tell me what would be some operations we could do to like a block of aluminum to get this end result. Well, I'll probably start with some three eighths aluminum if we can find it, some three eighths plate because that would make it we would that would avoid us having to face it or anything. OK, uh, so you're getting the three eighths number from the like the biggest thickness of the part. Oh, sorry. That, uh, sorry. Five eighths. Goodness. Yeah. Five eighths. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so we're looking at the the point six two five. Uh, can you guys see my cursor? Yes, I can. OK, mm -hmm. sweet. That's actually really useful then. All right. Um, so yeah, we're looking at the, the thickest part of the part. Uh, and so if we can get stock that same thickness, that'd be great. Um, really cuts down on the operations. It really does. Anything else, guys? Like next time after finding the material, finding the stock? Uh, yeah, just operations in general. Uh, we'll oh. drill more down into this later, but sure. just want to get an idea. Well, the border is probably um, either, I mean, there's a bunch of angles. So I guess they could be CNC'd, or I don't know if the CNC's are in the common machining area. I assume they would be. Um, but just generally, probably mill for the outer dimensions. Okay. Uh, so you're talking about these angles right here, right? Yes, and really just for the entire border. Okay, uh, so yeah, we do have CNC machines um, in the CMA. Um, although with this kind of plate, uh, you'll see it's actually pretty easy to um, water jet this profile if you wanted oh, to. Oh, sure. I always forget that's an option. Uh, yeah, it really saves a lot of time. We didn't have a water jet on my FRC team. <laughs> oh, shoot. <laughs> that's why I always forget. All right. Um, yeah, water jets would be a good, good call there. <laughs> Uh, what are we thinking for something like this region here? Um, and actually, if I go back a couple slides or maybe just one slide, uh, you'll see this is kind of a, a pocket area here um, taken out of the full thickness. How are we thinking on making something like that? Well, someone else pipe up, pipe up if you don't want me saying all the answers, but that would be probably a mill because that's rounded, rounded corners. OK, yeah. Uh, slap this on a, a mill and go to town on it. 
how about uh, these these holes here, which I believe are probably just yeah the through holes probably for some fastener. Could do that with the mill as well. Okay. Or CNC, then do whatever. I mean, of course, anything you can do on the CNC, or most things you can do on the normal mill, you can do on CNC. It's just like it's just a question of time. Okay. Yeah, that that's good. Uh, we're the, the only change being whatever tool you've got on the end of it, but yeah, we can do it on right. the same machine. Let's see here. Um, also, you can see there's a a, sh <clears throat> a shelf here as well, uh, like a, a larger rectangle. Probably the same operation as this smaller square as well. For what? Oh, for the the larger rectangle here because it is oh, yeah. slightly thinner. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try and give someone else a chance here. Anyone other than Nicholas, or do you want to go by Nick? Uh, whatever works for you. All right. Anyone other than Nicholas want to tell me how uh, we can go about making these holes up here on the side of the side plate, um, probably for screws up here or bolts, depending on what you subscribe to. Uh, feel free to unmute if you want to talk. Um, but yeah, this super interactive session. Uh, or if you're a little shy, you can type into the, the chat as well. Um, how would we make these 1 4th 20 uh, tapped holes? Well, maybe not tapped yet, but intended for tapping. Going once, twice. <laughs> One fourth twenty. Uh, Nick, you can take it away if you want. So you're just saying to for how to do the quarter the quarter frame holes? Yeah. Um, well, seeing as they're in a different orientation, obviously you can't do that with the same um, like setup in the CNC. Mm. But I mean, I imagine you. I guess you would depending on the on the um, precision you need. You could do that with a drill press and just line and just like line it up properly. Or if you want to. Probably do it the right way. You'd put it on the <laughs> mill or the CNC and uh, drill it with that. And then, I, I don't, if you guys have like a tapping head, I guess you could do or like one of those like spring center things. You could also tap it on on the mill in place. Um, Sean or Kyle, have any of you tapped anything in the CMA before? Yeah, you can I have not. Uh, our our base plate for rubber wrestling is tapped uh, in the Haas, I'm pretty sure. Nice. Yeah, I don't yes. think I don't think we would ever encourage you to tap on a manual mill. <laughs> the, the chance you break that tap is like so high. <laughs> oh wait, do you guys have like the fancy like spiral flute ones? Spiral? No, I don't think so. Okay, I was just curious. I've only I those actually actually, the actually the Haas might. I need to okay. look up an image to make sure. That would be the one where you can like power, um, you can power tap and like it work. But, <laughs> but you need to have, I think you, there needs to basically be a CNC yes. because, I mean, that, that's the kind of tap you don't need to back off at all. So. These, uh, Young actually has a, a set of these, I'm pretty sure. The spiral nice. taps. Oh, fun. Young is a legend, dude. I keep he hearing is. him. Oh my gosh. Um, He's got everything yeah. you need to do it right. <laughs> we uh we flip this 90 degrees and at least do um at least do a baseline hole for these and then either hand tap it or if we're doing it in the cnc just tap it and that goes well let's see here this is just an initial pass uh, we'll get more into the operations and further slides here uh, but yeah going back to stock selection uh, like you said grabbing stock that's the right size so we don't have to do unnecessary operations like if you grab a three-fourth uh, thick uh, aluminum stock you'll have to face that down to the five-eighths you want um, things like that really save yourself time and ultimately resources um, i know in the past there's there's always stock of all sorts of sizes in the shop um, whether they're leftover from previous projects or they're extra from current projects so you're likely to find um, common thicknesses 
available for stuff you need. Um, is there anything other than thickness you want to consider? Uh, Type of aluminum, like specific material. That's true. Um, if the design says 661 and it assumes that, but you just grab a 775 aluminum sheet and start rocking that, it could be issues. Uh, at least with three pounders for sure, because you're so tight on weight, uh, that density oh, difference sure. could definitely put you over. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure what the if there's even weight restrictions in um, other teams. Like I, I think Robo Wrestling definitely has weight restrictions, right? Yeah, we we can only be. Um, yeah, you know, I should definitely know this. <laughs> <laughs> three hundred grams, I think. Well, you could ask Juan. Yeah, I think three hundred grams is our weight. Yeah, so uh, definitely making three, sure three the kilograms. Yeah, three kilograms. <laughs> three kilograms. Three hundred grams is so light. What, what am I doing? I was wondering for a second. <laughs> That's like ant weight battle bots. Um, yeah, the Robo Wrestling bot has a three kilogram restriction. Nice, nice. thank you, thank you, yeah. appreciate it. I gotta say, I really yeah. appreciate the metric, though. <laughs> uh -huh. Yeah, exactly. Um, but yeah, making sure the the stock you grab is the actual right um, kind. Um, also, seeing as how we do share spaces with um, uh, with other teams that are also working, make sure the the stock that you're using is either yours, like it was purchased for your team, or if it's not yours, that you've confirmed who it belonged to and that they're cool with you using it. Because um, there are things beyond just building the bot that you need to consider. Um, but yeah, so that's, that's stock selection. Moving on to the order of operations. Um, now, to a degree, you could probably do these operations in whatever order you wanted to. There's gonna be a sane way, and then there's a crazy way. Um, so with the the five eighths aluminum uh, you've chosen, uh, considering what order you want to do the operations in, um, what do you guys think would be first um, for machining this? Probably the facing, or at least like the um, not not the facing, but like the large area, like that large, like the thinner area, maybe. That's true. Um, but how do you get that outer profile first? Oh, I guess, I mean, you want to square off one side relative to the flat, or ideally to a factory edge. If not a factory edge, then square off two sides and go from there. Oh, so you're saying do that rectangular, um, I guess, I guess that shelf region first while it's still stock, like That's on the what sheet? I was I guess uh, I don't know that that wouldn't make sense at all. You, you, you'd want to at least cut it out to close to the final dimension, dimensions in X and Y before you do that. But I meant more so, like you're going to want to do that before you cut out the outer profile, probably, because you'll have better grip and it's a big cut. OK, yeah, that's that's smart. Um, also, the the water jet process is going to be cutting out holes. Oh, yeah, I keep reading it's the water jet. <laughs> um, oh, so like. Whether you do the water jet first and then face down that large region, or face first and water jet, um, typically we uh, we would water jet first and then face it, um, just because that way it's you're only operating on the small piece rather than the large stock. Sure. Um, and of course, there are things to consider that it's not exactly best practice to be facing over like pre-existing holes, um, yeah. but. With these uh, soft materials and s relatively small operations, we can get away with it. Uh, but yeah, so the, the water jet, um, you can give it some 2D profile, cuts it out. You'll get that kind of bone shape from the, the part. Um, like, I guess, like a cudgel or a club, whatever. <laughs> um, and then at least some attempt at those holes from the water jet. Sure. Now, uh, definitely that rectangular pocket because you can't get that with anything else. Unless you got like a rectangular brooch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh yeah, yeah, the 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 slot in there. Yeah. Um. Now, off the top of your head, would you know why um, the holes coming off the water jet shouldn't be trusted? The product is perfectly circular. It might work hard in the material. That's all I can think of. It, it wouldn't be. 
also if it's too yeah i think like it'd be hard to get a consistent cut also because it'll probably does a water jet kind of like cone out as it goes down yeah the the taper right That's yeah the... so uh, the um the cylinder quote unquote of your hole uh isn't a, actually a cylinder um five eighths i think you'll definitely see some at least some significant taper there um I've seen mostly like quarter inch plates and even then you got it. You have enough taper there where puzzle fits don't work out of the box. Sure. Um, but yeah, it's not, not going to be perfectly circular. Um, and then I'm not, I'm not sure about the machine hardening part. That's um, more ME yeah, MSC than I mean, that maybe we more of a laser cutting thing. Yeah, that, that could be the case. But yeah, so exactly. starting off with that, water jet operation to get a good starting point um see oh sweet water jet time yeah cutting the profile you'll make some dxf out of it hopefully your mech lead uh gives you the dxf for it or at least sets you up so it's pretty easy to generate um i'm not sure i i haven't i haven't been head on a uh, a water jet operation kyle or sean can you just can you put the the drawing? No, the, the drawing's gonna cut out where there's like other artifacts. I think in the last piece, CAD guy yeah. said to delete all the lines that weren't part of the uh, that weren't part of the border, mm -hmm. and then say that as DXF. Yep. Okay. That's exactly right. You just you just make all the lines on the um, on the you. So you take a drawing, you delete all the extraneous lines besides the outer profile, like the actual profile that you would like to cut. Mm -hmm. uh, with the water jet, and then you import that into, I forget what the software is called that we have on the water jet, but uh, you can just run in and it will make a path for you. Sweet. Based on the hour profile. Oh, that's something OSS? Yeah. yeah, it's something like that, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, hopefully your mech league gives you um, that pared down drawing as well, or the DXF. Um, so you can just slap that in the water jet and cut that out. Um, you'll get an end result, uh, like we talked about before. It's not exactly what we want, um, but it's got all the top-down operations we need. Um, and so, yeah, the next step here, facing like you were talking about, Nick, um, we could have done the facing, or at least the, the large rectangular facing beforehand, um, but there are definitely, I think there's the one pocket in there that needs to be faced. Um, how... I guess in a, a broad sense, how would you go about taking the, the cutout part and then facing it on the mill? Um, and you don't have to be super specific, just like what are things to consider when you're doing this facing operation? Well, make sure the, make sure the part you're cutting is above the jaws. Above the... Uh, the jaws, the mill? I guess I'm not... Oh, how, how like, you... the, like the vice type deal? Yeah. Gotcha. Nice jaws. So use the right parallels. All right. Um, any uh, any first guess at like what kind of tool we'll be using in the in the mill? It's two fluid end mill, right? For aluminum, yes. Yeah, because it, it binds. You want to get less teeth. I think. And then uh, don't expect you to know this because it is it's very like in the weeds. Uh, but do you know what the the mill will look like, or the end mill will look like, um, like based off of the, the the plating or whatever the coating on the end mill, um, either gold or kind of like a steel looking color? Oh, I forget. Yeah, that's uh, a I, hard question. <laughs> it, it is. Um, I, know I, I, I know there's the the one coating which has aluminum in it that you don't want to use, but I forget which one. I forget what that looks like. Yeah, I think uh, I cheated a little bit and I looked at the slides. Um, I believe it is the uh, the gold looking one. That um, let's see here. I definitely used gold-looking ones on aluminum before. I don't know if that's the same the same coating, but yep, the uh, the gold-looking one for aluminum or just no coating. Right. Okay. But yeah, that that's way in the weeds. Don't worry about that. <laughs> yeah, I think all of our HSS bits and mills and end mills have gold coating on them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um. But yeah, so that that's. It's kind of the gist there for facing. Um, even the even the manual mills in the shop, 
have some form of like programming you can do um, for something as simple as a pocket where it'll do the passes for you, um, bringing the, the tool across it. Um, but workplace holding, right? So you talked about making sure it was, it was high enough in the jaws yep. um, for the operation. Um, because we'll be working with the assumption that we're doing this pocket here, uh, something that should uh, stand out to you is how it shares um, like the bottom face of the part, right? So if we're vicing it along this plane, we're going to have it. Careful. Yeah, if we don't, we really want to make sure we don't uh, <laughs> mill into the vice. Uh, that's that's worst case scenario. Um, and so securing this actually could be a little, little hairy. Yeah, I guess it's totally possible. Oh yeah. Um, orientation. Um, so it's it's kind of hard to convey this through words, um, but I guess which faces of the part um, would you have in contact with the vice? Um, Probably the well, top and bottom, or the not top and bottom, but based on the, yeah. based on the front view of the drawing, the top and bottom of that. Okay. Touching the vice jaws. Uh, probably supported up by some parallels of some sort. Yep. Um, yeah, this is more of what the vices look like in the shop. Um, Magnum. Our parallel set does not look as shiny and new as that one. <laughs> Extremely grimy. <laughs> Oh man, um, but yeah. So effectively, you would just uh, support the part on a pair of parallels um, in between the the vice there. Uh, screw that um, tight, and that'll squeeze those um, squeeze the part between those two planes. Uh, and with any luck, the part will be secured to where you can face it without it moving at all <laughs> or minimally. We can also use finger clamps. Sure. Um, finger clamps take forever, at least in my opinion, to set up. Um, but they're definitely lifesavers for some of the parts I've had to make, um, where it's like an awkward geometry and there's just no way you can vice it in, uh, or the thing you're cutting out. Um, you can't really cut it out while it's in the vise. Um, but yeah, you can set up these finger clamps, which there's like um, there's like tracks in the table, and these screw in to hold the part down to the table um, at whatever points you want. Uh, this actually gives you a lot of freedom in where you secure the part. So in the previous one, if you were afraid that maybe the part was too thin. Um, sure. Or there was some interesting geometry that made it where, um, oh man, maybe if I clamp it at this uh, axis, um, there could be deformation. Uh, the finger clamps get you around that. Um, and in fact, I, uh, yeah, my three pound team ran into this issue where we had cut out slits, um, kind of like the, the grill of a car and the top plate. And then we'd also pocketed that portion of the top plate. And so when we went to vice it in to do another operation, um, it, we actually, we vice it just too tight and we could see like the, the bars going across like almost buckled. Um, so yeah, it's, that, that's definitely an edge case. Some very cursed stuff that maybe shouldn't have happened. Um, but yeah, the finger clamps allow you a lot of freedom in how you secure it at the table. I think specifically for this uh, part, the only thing that you'd be able to do with finger clamps is the pocket. Like, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Because of that, that bottom edge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, I feel like you could do that. I mean, I don't know how, how big, <laughs> I don't know the scale of this, but I feel like I've gripped pretty small amounts of the part and still been able to like face things in the past. How big is that part? It's it's five eight thick. All right, five eighths. Yeah, so if we, it's an eighth, uh, it pockets an eighth deep. Uh, so you're really looking at maybe half an inch of 
I mean, at yes. most, half an inch of grip. I mean, I think that's plenty, personally, but... Yeah, I, th I think you could do the pocket. I don't think you could do the face. And all the other operations are through, so you couldn't do those with face clamps. I'm sorry, yeah, finger clamps. Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> we, we like our... Half inch material. That's, like, decent, though. For you're saying for the face operation, I'm worried about the twist. Yeah. Twist. So you can't grip the material you're facing, so you can only grip on the right side of this image with face clamps, and you would have to put all of your force on the left side uh, while you face it. And I think that would twist it out of the clamps. So, repeat that, please. So if you have finger clamps, um, when you're doing a facing operation, so finger clamps, you have it right on the bed or the um, uh, what is it called? The the mill operating area right yeah. the mill right. table um you can't clamp clamp on the right side of this for the facing operation um be or the sorry the left side of this with facing operation because that's where the material yeah <laughs> good, that's, good, that's good not the middle i was looking for uh, on the left side of this because you're going to be wanting to remove that material with the face right. right uh so the only place you'd be able to clamp was on the right side um, and I would not be, I would not feel comfortable just clamping the right side and then putting all my force on the left, because I think there's going to be a moment arm that happens when you start to face the material, right. uh, from the force of interacting with it. I think it's going to make it twist. Wait, so uh, you're saying you wouldn't want to use finger clamps for the facing? I would not use finger clamps for the facing. Okay. Sorry. We're in agreement then. I just missed that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think he was talking about, um, Nick was talking about the vice, like vicing it and facing it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I agreed. I was saying half inch would be enough for the vice to hold on to. Yes, <laughs> agreed, absolutely. All right, we're on the same page. Um, we already talked about tooling mostly. Um, as far as like size of uh, end mill, um, that really becomes a factor depending on how much material you're trying to take out and how small that pocket is. Yeah, um, the, for the pocket, it just depends on the corner radius of the pocket. Yeah. Or uh, less, less than that, I guess, but equal to it probably be easiest. I'm thinking it's like a quarter inch um, radius in the corners there. Um, don't know for sure. Um, the order in which we conduct the facing operations. Uh, so let's say we just straight up water did it out. We didn't do any facing beforehand. Um, what kind of order should we be thinking? Um, the smaller one than the larger one, or the larger one than the smaller one, um, right. like the the face and then pocket. Probably the face, then the pocket, then move on to holes, and then the holes in the side. Yeah, that, that sounds good. Because um, if you're making the biggest cut, you probably want the most material still there to support it. Mm -hmm. If you cut out the pocket, then it's harder to grip it. For sure. In this case, in this case it probably wouldn't matter that much. But as I guess I think that's the general rule of thumb that I followed. Plus, I think uh, if you did the the pocket first and then the face, uh, you could run into some interesting interactions at the corner. Oh, the, sure. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so if you want, you could throw out a uh, one of those large facing end mills. Oh, yeah. um, <laughs> I've personally never used one of these. Um, but yeah, the, the quarter inch end mill will definitely serve you for the pocket. Um, maybe something a little bigger if you wanted to do the face with an end mill, like a normal end mill. Yeah. Um, talk about flute number, um, whether two or four, I'm not even sure if we have a three in the shop. Um, but yeah, the, the flute number, because, uh, dependent on the fact that we're actually using or cutting into aluminum, um, and then we're actually going to get into, I believe, right after this. Yep, mill tool feed and spindle feed. Uh, so this is where we kind of get into the weeds of like numerics in machining. Uh, so how fast we're spinning the actual tool and how fast we're moving the part we're machining across. Um, well, not across the table, the table moves, but how, how fast the tool is being driven into the part. Um, and determining those speeds is pretty important on making sure you get a quality cut and you don't risk damaging the machine or the tool. Now, sure, someone out there has already memorized tables and tables of this stuff. I'm sure. Um, but 
that's what we have the internet for. FS Wizard has been suggested. Um, where you just plug and play. Hey, I got this material, cutting this much off uh, with this tool, and it just tells you, hey, you should spin your tool up to the speed and feed it in at this speed. Um, I think if I click on the link, oh, there we go. Uh, yeah, so I think it's just an app then. Isn't there a um isn't there a web browser version, Sean or Kyle? Yeah, I'm pretty sure there is, but I I do not remember it to be honest. Okay, I'm, I'm not gonna mess with this. Um, but yeah, I, I know Alex definitely attests. Uh, Alex Field definitely attests to like uh, I believe it's FS Wizard, the app. Um always using that thing when he's out in the shop. Uh, but yeah, that'll tell you those those feeds and speeds. Uh, no need to do any calculations <coughs> in that respect. Uh, but when it comes to holes, what are we thinking here? Uh, I know we had some clearance holes, some through holes. Uh, let me go back to the drawing, go over this. All right, so uh, assuming we're going to keep it viced in like we did before uh, using this face in this face, right? Um, what are we thinking for these whole operations? Just spitballing. Does it really matter what order you take it in? No, I, I, I don't think it would matter what I order. I would just pick one diameter and start doing stuff. OK, I just do all the ones with the same diameter in there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think these are all through. Yeah, I but, don't know off the top of my head if these are actually the same measurement. <laughs> if, um, if 5 16th and the 0.27 is just rounded or it something. Will be, it will be roughly the, the same. But I think for the either way for the threaded, you want it, it would you need an undersized hole anyway because of how taps work. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Because I know, I mean, 5 16th would be like point. To f yeah, I mean, actually, no. Now that would be maybe they are the same. I don't know. Yeah, I think these might be the same. Um, and just one was it's using a hole tool, and the other was just <laughs> a manual diameter. Yeah, uh, if, if that think, is the case, it's a little uh, confusing of a drawing. Um, yeah. Probably you would just, if, if that is the case, you would just mark the hold dimension as like typical or times X or something, how many holes there are. It is interesting. You, have, you probably have to ask your Mac to go look at the back <laughs> real quick. Um, but yeah, uh, and these are all just through holes. Um, so you just punch these through. Um, we actually, yeah, we get into the more specific stuff on this face when we start doing tapped holes. Um, so assuming, because this, this is the plane that the water jet shot through, uh, so there's nothing to start us off here. Um, what are we thinking for achieving the end goal of like maybe just an undersized hole for these? So repeat that. Oh, so we're starting with a flat face, right? A flat aluminum face. Right. Um, and what are our first thoughts on how to go from that flat face to a hole meant for tapping? Um, a, like a fourth twenty. Um, well, I don't know if there's some kind of. I mean, I, I, are you saying how do we measure the depth? Those are our blind holes. Um. Well, I guess because I mean, we use we use an edge finder to and use the dimensions to measure the locations of the holes based on the side of the um of the part. Mm -hmm. I guess it'd be a little confusing if we had the um, tapered water jet side. I'm not sure how you do that if you go to the w widest or the smallest um, <laughs> part of it, but um, yeah, those are always fun you know, with that taper. Yeah, but I mean, I guess you just use the edge finder to find the right location and I don't know, just like let me touch off on the surface to get your zero for the depth and then use that. Use your, I assume it has a Z, does, it, does, does the mill DRO have a Z axis on the DRO? Uh, most of them do. OK, if it um, does, then just use that. If not, use the the wheels. Oh, man, using the wheels. Oh, geez. Yeah, um, the one but yeah. 
the the, the uh, mill we have at my at my FRC shop um, didn't have a ZDRO, so we always used the um, the dials on the knee. So that was fun. <laughs> oh man, not too bad, but you know, a little, little bit of pain. A little bit, yeah. Um, we didn't do too many pockets. <laughs> what types of uh, of tools would we need um, in the mill? We think in no oh, twist drills. Okay. Taps. Taps. If we're doing the yep, CNC, I really ought to CNC tap something one of these days, just to know what it's like not to have to do it by hand. <laughs> it, it is scary. I will give you the look into it. Very spooky. It, it's spooky to me thinking of tapping something on the lathe. You know. Oh yeah. Oh, oh yeah, my that, that gosh. Also, that also seems very scary. <laughs> hey, you, wouldn't do, you wouldn't do it powered though, would you? Um, you could just put the tap in the tailstock and then just leave the tailstock loose and then just spin the the head by hand. Or the same thing. Yeah, if you do it by hand, I think it's possible. Uh, why is this a thing? Like, this is really weird. Like, I can't tell if someone's trying to speak or if they're, back, if they're, um, they're muted. Yeah, okay. there's one in the background. Okay. Um, but yeah, so getting the right drill bit is really important uh, for these machining operations. Um, whether it's a through hole or a clear, or whether it's a clearance hole um, or a tapped hole will change what drill bit you're using. Um, we've got a helpful little chart up in the shop, um, but also there's all sorts of online resources. We can just look up, hey, drill in a 40. Um, 40 thread size, and it'll tell you what drill bit you need to accomplish that. Um, I have yet to memorize uh, which drill bit I need for a 440, even though I feel like I ought to by now. <laughs> um, but yeah, those are how you do the, the clearance holes. Um, just going straight through it is you would only need a drill bit. Uh, however, the, um, the tap holes are a little different. Um, and actually, I would know if we go on to spindle speeds here. Yeah, so um, drilling into aluminum, there is a uh, kind of a common rule of thumb. Um, but roughly, how many RPM are we thinking should we run the mill at if we're drilling just into aluminum with a drill bit? I would Google it. I don't know. That's that is the smartest answer out there. I would Google it because um, unless you're doing this all the time, um, it doesn't hurt to look it up. You know, yeah. Uh, there is definitely different spindle speeds for different materials. Uh, typically, anywhere in the neighborhood of a thousand to fifteen hundred RPM for aluminum, uh, and five hundred to eight hundred for steel, uh, just based off of the difference in their uh, their hardness. Uh, you know, we're at lower, higher speeds. Um, so for this part, we'll want to run it in the ballpark of 1200 RPM uh, for drilling these holes. Next up is a press fit. Now, press fits, um, oh. yes, very is cursed. Is that the rectangular part or the hole? Uh, it is the bigger That's hole the in the pocket. The thing OK. Yeah, right in here. All right. Um, and so you can see this is actually dimensioned out for 1.125 1 uh, diameter. And if we pull up the link provided here, we can actually see the part we're intending to put in there. Yeah. Uh, is this ball bearing, um, which gives us also an outer diameter. And if you remember from the previous uh, week's slides, um, to get this press fit, we're going to have to choose a very specific diameter for that uh, that hole for the ball bearing to go into. Uh, and given the fact that ball bearings, um, they are a real thing that's manufactured, they are never exact. Uh, we have to take into account that there is some tolerance. So typically, um, it's it's safe to. Here we go. Oh, that's what I want. Um, well, actually, I, I guess I'll I'll leave it to the audience first. How are we thinking we want to 
um, manufacture this press fit hole for a bearing. Uh, given the fact that we know what the diameter should be of the bearing. Um, and yeah, I think technically, I think you're probably best bet is to use the CNC, but isn't there, all, couldn't you also like use a reamer or something like that? Uh, I've never used a reamer before. Kyle, Sean, um, rather you. I've never used a reamer, no, but I'm, I guess you could, yeah. Well, not nope, that I, I haven't either. Neither have I, so let's not go with that then. <laughs> CNC is my guess. Uh, yeah, CNC will definitely um, get you a, a pretty accurate hole there. Um, typically, it's it's safe to kind of undercut in the, the aspect that you don't cut too much material away. You cut less material than you intend to. Um, and then kind of progressively test your ball bearing with that that seat okay. uh, just to get a, a look and a feel for how it's sitting um, because if you cut off let's say 0.125 and yeah, for, for some reason it's too like the hole's too big like yeah you can't can't add material at that point um, <laughs> well, you, yeah you look for alternative methods at that point yeah um, so you don't really want to just program in a tall like a, a specific dimension you want to just sneak up on it yeah so if it's okay. 0. 0.125 um I, see, I, I believe i've typically you shoot for like maybe a 0. 0.12 maybe flat 0. 0.12 sure. um inch hole and then just yeah set the ball bearing in there how each time or something like that yeah uh, taking off some progressive amount until um you get a good fit for it um uh, I believe I was, I was talking to someone in Battle Lots about this of like what a good fit looks like for a bearing. Like when you set it in the pocket and you can tell, oh, I can press this in and it'll sit well without crunching and whatnot. Um, they said it looks like it's just about to fall in, you know, like it's about to fall in right. uh, to whatever hole you've made. Um, but it just barely doesn't, you know. Right. Um, you know, it, it's definitely too big if you can like push it in with your thumb. Um, and it's definitely too small if it's sitting there and it doesn't wobble a little bit. Sh there should be a little bit of wobble. Um, but yeah, going at it progressively and then when you feel you have a good hole, um, testing that, right, pressing it in um, and giving it a, a couple spins to see what you're working with. Um, if it's crunchy, uh, then you definitely know the hole is too small. Uh, you're getting some too much interference there. And uh, if the bearing falls through your hole, then you've got a different problem. <laughs> uh, and yeah, so drilling these holes. There's a little awkward holes to press fit the holes. Um, but OK. Um, drilling the holes in the top and the bottom of the part, uh, like I was saying earlier, uh, we do need to consider a few more things than the other holes did. Um, how we're going to hold the uh, the part in the vise. Yeah. Um, and typically you could probably maybe sandwich it in between the the two wide faces. Um, if it hadn't been faced yet, once you face it, it starts getting a little wonky at that point. Um, and so yeah, this may be a point where you decide maybe the holes are a first operation after the the water jet um but yeah how you hold it is something you definitely want to consider here what are what's the audience thinking slash nick <laughs> um for as far as, yeah how to hold the part when you're doing those side holes yeah like i i think i mean your best best project is to squeeze it between the vice jaws right um mm -hmm. I guess if you have it like overhanging at all, you could use like what, like a machinist jack or whatever it's called, like the little spinny thing. I'm not sure if you guys use those, but I think I've seen those before. The the machinist jack? Like that's like a that's like a little tiny screw jack that you spin by hand, and that like, or it's it's basically a screw in a nut, and but it's precise, and so you can twist that to extend it, and it can kind of act as a adjustable height 
offset thing just to support a um, like a hanging end of the part. I don't believe we have these actually. Well, I don't think I don't think you've. I I just think I think I've seen those somewhere. I I definitely never used them either. I I don't think it's really that big. I think you could probably just squeeze it in in the vice shows. Mm -hmm. It definitely, if it was a long part, you run into that issue. Yeah, just get it level, squeeze it hard enough that the friction isn't going to give way when you push Mm. on. But yeah, so um, definitely vice it, get some parallels, make sure you've got a uh, a level surface. And then even if you want measuring the the surface to ensure it's parallel with the horizontal plane. Um, And then tooling for these holes. So of course we have the, the same drill bits from before. Probably different sizes for the undersized hole. Um, but then we have some other specific tool we'll probably need um, a center drill bit. Sure. Um, so definitely don't want to drill right into a flat surface with a drill bit, uh, even if there is. Um, I, I don't know if I've seen any center cutting um, drill bits in the shop or I haven't used them. But it's definitely it's just safer to go with the center drill bit first so you don't get any kind of dancing on that surface. Um, yep. For anyone else listening, dancing is like where you go into a, a flat surface with the drill bit. And before it's actually cut anything out of the part, um, the drill bit starts moving Wonder. across the surface of the uh, of the part. Um, and you call that dancing because it's kind of dancing across the surface. <laughs> definitely not precise. Definitely not what we want to do. And then spindle speeds are the same as before. We're cutting to the same material uh, with mostly the same tools. Right. Uh, keep in mind, um, and you'll you'll probably learn this more when you get CMA trained. Um, but some of the machines are finicky in how they want you to change spindle feeds. Uh, I believe most of them, though, you need to be running the machine as you change the spindle speed, um, which seems a little wonky that you got to spin it up first and then like turn this dial to um, to slow it down and speed it up. But we want to make sure to do it that way. Um, it's like a bike. You don't you don't change gears on a bike when the bike stopped. That's true. Um, but then it'll it'll flip a 180 on you, and if you want to change like the, the I direction, gotta be off. <laughs> yeah, changing direction, you gotta make sure that's off. Uh, I believe I think it's the Bridgeport. Um, we have a mill that's a a manual, so you change it like manually. Oh, that's fun. Um, I stay away from that one because um, I've never used it, and uh, I'm not confident with that, but. If you figure it out, more power to you. Um, most of them, three out of four of them are a, uh, you can just turn some spindle or turn some dial and turn down the, turn up or turn down the spindle speed. Turn down for what? <laughs> oh man. Uh, and then yeah, tapping. So as we've brought up before, uh, you can of course CNC tap holes um, where the machine handles the spindle speed and the descent rate to get you just what kind of um, what of tap threads you want for a hole. Um, or you could go old fashioned uh, with the hand tap, <laughs> which takes much longer than a CNC, but builds you don't character. have to. Yeah, builds character. Yeah. Um, Unless you break like, a tap, then it doesn't, then it doesn't build character. It builds sadness. Oh, man. Breaking taps is no fun, not for the part, not for the the uh, the shop manager, <laughs> not for you. <laughs> no, no one's having fun if you break a tab. Um, but yeah, that's these are what those taps will look like commonly. Um, basically, you already have the undercut hole, uh, and you just fasten these to some handle, um, lube up the hole and start driving into it a couple turns, driving out a couple turns. Uh, And you'll do these for whatever tapped holes you have in the part. So in our case, let's see if I can do this real clever. Oh man, that was not clever at all. It will be clever when you remember the slide number. Yeah, eight. All right, so when we're looking at our drawing here, these holes are tapped, right? Uh, 
yeah. that's given here. Um, one fourth twenty. So you would just look up what the um, what the tap is for that. Um, typically, we have the taps for whatever common hole sizes you're trying to use. Uh, and yeah, you would um, ideally you would vice this in some way, probably not on the milling table, um, probably in our shop in some way. We have some vices in there as well. Vice it down and drive at it perpendicular to the face that you're tapping into um, and tap it with your uh, your part or with your tool. And that was fast. <laughs> Very clever. Very clever. Um, but yeah, making sure that you take it slowly if you're doing it manually, because breaking taps is, uh, at least for new members, pretty common. Um, and then not forgetting to use some kind of lubricant for that topping, that tapping operation. And yeah, um, ideally at no stage of this, um, you didn't mismeasure anything and you didn't misprogram your CNC if you used that. Um, and yeah, ideally you have some finished part, which will be literally rough around the edges. So you'll probably want to deburr. Um, some of those, the burring is kind of like this crescent blade um, that the burring tool is. A crescent blade that kind of run along corners and whatnot. Um, if you screwed something up or if something's not really up to spec, you can remachine things. Um, and filing, oh my gosh, my favorite part of the it's process. So oh my gosh, when you when you do puzzle fits for a part, this part right here, Oh, uh, in fact, ooh, this as well. Ooh, um, that's violent. In the design, you say, oh man, this is going to be X length and it's going to fit in just right. It's going to be like Legos. Uh, and then you get the actual part and it's off by like even a millimeter. Uh, and now your puzzle fit doesn't quite work. So you got to file that down until they do interface. Um, so yeah, tolerancing will avoid or at least severely mitigate the amount of filing you need to do. Uh, but if you don't tolerance anything, uh, there's always the file. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so let's go ahead and get started in our Kahoot here. Um, while I'm setting this up, does anyone have any questions? Um, is there anything I said that was confusing or um, just anything really? You can pop that in the chat or unmute and speak up. But yeah, let me go ahead and fire up this Kahoot. Any of y'all heard that of is like Spring on YouTube? What was that? Any of y'all heard of ClickSpring on YouTube? Just ClickSpring? Curious. I have not. I've heard of it. He, he's like, he's really, really, really good at filing. He files his own. <laughs> he files his own. I'm not even kidding. He's really good at filing. Oh, man. Yes, he files like perfect square inserts for broach, like for broached holes. He like files his own gears out of brass. Dude. It's, it's Damn. Filing out of gears. Then that's yes. a god right like there. Like proper Intelu gears, like proper spur gears out of, out of brass, which is the file. Mm. He's insane. Okay. Uh, just before we start, I, I had something I just wanted to show everyone. Oh, yeah, good. Like, no, illegal. <laughs> Not allowed. <laughs> Excuse me, I'm the trainer here. <laughs> okay, I wonder if anyone, can you guys... Again. Yeah, so this is the effect of Loctite on a set screw. So like this part is from a Robocop robot, like this part is the kicker, this part is made of aluminum, and there's like a steel rod that's supposed to like continue from here, and we use the set screw to connect the two. And this one had Loctite used on it, and it's probably not the most clear thing. But after we tried to remove it, the screw just basically sheared off. <laughs> oh man! The music yeah. that's yeah. works. Yeah, epoxy's <laughs> really strong. What can you say? Yeah, I mean this is an old part, so we're not sad about it. But yeah, <laughs> it's unfortunate. So is the takeaway don't use super heavy Loctite, or what's the takeaway? Well, that's how powerful Loctite is. Ah, type B strong. <laughs> Loctite and something, be sure you want it Loctite. Yeah. Yeah. All right. All right. So let me throw up the um, stream again.
screen one. Yeah. Uh, so there's game pin one one two seven nine seven five nine five. I you got, you got Nick. Weird. Uh, we're missing one person, uh, Brian. There you are, sweet. Uh -huh. Sweet. What machine is this? You got a shaper? Do we have a shaper? <laughs> Sean, I don't even know what that is. Isn't that like I honestly, haven't even heard of it? Yeah. I think isn't that like the, like the horizontal thing? Like it goes back and forth, and like it can with, with like a cutter, like cuts. Shaper. I think it like are cuts you, a few ways and stuff like that. Are you talking about a flame shaver? No, I'm think. I think I'm thinking of a shaper. You stroke you position play. handling, rock we'll go, driving. Well, the thing you described sounded like a shaver. But let me maybe it is, but I don't. Maybe maybe we're thinking different things. I don't know how this machine works. But yeah, this is a uh, a mill, right? So we got the table you're going to attach your part to, uh, and it spins things super fast. Uh, okay. Note the red button up there for the buddy to press when things if things go wrong. <laughs> Yo. How are you going to bring CAD dimensions with you into the machine shop? Are they on your phone? This was a question last week. Well, I think I'm I hoping know. for 100 percent on this thing. I know this question was asked before, probably not last week, but from one of the other weeks. This is just a, like all of them have yeah. been asked before. Yeah, because week seven and eight cahoots are just review cahoots. Right. So, yeah, it's possible the question's been reused. Uh -huh. Yep. If uh, if you're memorizing CAD dimensions, uh, you're gonna have a bad time. <laughs> Which is the most efficient way to mass produce threads in a part? Forcing. <laughs> just take the bolt and turn it into the untapped hole until it produces a thread. Honestly, anything's a tap if you try hard enough. And if it doesn't produce a thread, on the bright side, the screw probably won't come out. <laughs> what? Thread milling. Um, does someone want to explain the difference between thread milling and power tapping? Personally, I'm not sure on what the major difference is between the two. Sean or Kyle? Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to think. Power tapping versus thread milling? Isn't thread milling like it? I don't know. I think I, I think thread milling. It's I mean I, I picked the wrong answer, but I'm pretty sure it's like a smaller. I think it's smaller than the actual hole, and like it's actually like a a mill that you run around the side that the perimeter of the hole as opposed to just cutting it all at once. I think it kind of cuts it cuts the, the lines in like at a slanted angle, so that when you see and see it the right way. Hmm. It, Oh, yeah, yeah so that's what I see what you're talking right. about. Yeah. Skip all your drawing. So there you use go. some sort of CNC process to go around the diameter. Yeah, there yeah you okay, cool. Yeah. Okay. Ah. And because the, I guess it's kind of like a um, a tap, but I guess you don't need a super cucumbus. Yeah. All wow. right. Look at that. That's pretty cool. Do we have a thread milling in the shop? Uh, I don't think so. Not. No. Don't <laughs> think so. No. Maybe the yeah. CNC. Ask Young. I I guess modify so. this slide or this Kahoot for next yeah. year. Sad. <laughs> what is the toughest material of those listed? Oh, yeah. I forget. Both aluminum, 660 or 661 and 775. You've got some mysterious material, ABS PLA. Alpha ballistic steel. 
Maybe knowing what God. these materials are. Oh, there we go. Yep. Maybe so. it's in PLA are used for 3D printing. Indeed. Yep. Okay, so you forgot. Um, but yeah, so of course the 3D printed plastics will be a lot less tough than the aluminum. And comparing 661 and 775, 775 is definitely of higher quality. Uh, biggest difference there, of why you wouldn't always use it, is price point. Does bigger number mean better? Or is it kind of <laughs> yes. Huh. Amongst the plastics, I believe ABS is stronger than PLA. I believe that so, yeah. That's what three pounders uh, are using. Oh, I forget. Finish machining a steel part, and now you machine an aluminum one. You're going to blank the tool's rotational speed, the spindle speed. Increase. Mm -hmm. So now you're going from a very hard uh, material to a very soft material. And so now you can increase the tool's rotational speed without having to worry about putting extra strain on either the tool or the machine. Right, okay. I'm back, baby. <laughs> what machining tool would you use to make the belt groove in this pulley? So we're talking about uh, this smaller diameter region of this overall cylinder. I like the idea of using a water jet for that. You just that like line, is, line it up right <laughs> in the side and then just spin it. I think I've seen videos. Interesting. Uh, so we'll definitely want to use a lathe for this operation because uh, it, it's all concentric, uh, very radially symmetric. Um, milling, it would be very difficult uh, to get that rectangular cutout um, all around the entirety of the part. Um, you can maybe get that inner circle done. But yeah, lathe is definitely the way to go for this. Yeah, you, you just really need like an index head or something like that to make that work. You just aim your water jet at the lathe. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Efficiency. What is tolerancing? Is it putting up with your teammates? I don't know. adding additional leeway to prevent part interference. That's definitely going to come into effect when you're doing puzzle fits. Or right? to ensure part interference. Um, yeah, we, puzzle fits, you do want um, some level of interaction there. Um, but just given the nature of how we machine them, uh, if we don't tolerance, they'll just end up not actually interfacing without filing. Uh, which material is magnetic? Where's ABS, my alpha ballistic steel? <laughs> oh, That's man. incredibly magnetic. We got both our aluminums there. We got some A36 steel. We got some titanium characters. But yeah, steel, I believe, and correct me if I'm wrong here, I think it's steel because there's iron present within it. Yep. Yeah, yes. It's ferromagnetic. There we go. Technically, the, the other ones be magnetic, but it'd be like diamagnetic or paramagnetic, which is like a stupid technicality. <laughs> Gotta like really try hard to make it magnetic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, which end mill or what end mill do you use to machine an internal fillet? That's the internal curve which, of like a pocket. I don't know which direction of internal you're talking about, but I have a, I have a guess. I assume we mean like. Point. Like, I assume we mean from wall to floor, fill it. Yeah, like, so in this case, because it's ball and mill, it would be wall yeah. to floor. Um, maybe maybe reword it a little bit. Yeah, reword it to be more specific. Um, but yeah, to, to speak to what you're talking about, uh, the ball and mill would give us the, the vertical to horizontal fillet. Um, but if we wanted one that was, uh, the fillet was all on the same plane as, um, plane. as the table. Yeah. Uh, any, oh. any, any ML. Yeah, just about any. I'm on fire. <laughs> Let's go. And last question here, true or false? This is, oh, oh my gosh. gosh. Uh, is this a screw? Uh, I think the biggest so. question a, of them all. Actual answer for this, but I, whenever, when I think screw, I think wood screw, as opposed to 
machine screw. I think machine screw is still a thing. Maybe not. I got it right, so I'm not complaining. So, I believe technically it's a bolt, right? Um, What's the reason for that again? Because it doesn't make its own thread or something like that? Uh, I believe that, and also it's a constant diameter along the length of oh. it. Um, the screw tapers towards the end. That's true. But yeah, if you call it a screw in the shop, um, no, one cares. no one's, no one's going to get on to you. And if they get on to you, they're either joking or taking it too seriously. Oh, Got to yeah. find them. Left-handed Allen keys. <laughs> oh, man. Let's go. That is the last Kahoot. Which means the only one that matters. Good job, everybody. Good job, guys. Go ahead and one more slide guide time. We'll just go ahead and um, pass through this to make sure everyone's on the same page. I believe that'll be in the speaker notes down here. There we go. So we're going to we're going to want you to model a real life part. Um, and so this is kind of this is going to be a lot more open ended than our previous. Uh, CAD guides um, because you'll just choose something uh, in your room or really just anything you want um, and CAD it. Now, this doesn't have to be super complicated, uh, so don't go out there and to the inch model the Empire State Building, um, but really just try and take something in real life and turn it into CAD uh, as a demonstration of what you've learned so far uh, and Choose something at least a little complex, maybe like a bottle, um, something with varying geometry. If you go and CAD a, uh, a book and just make a rectangular prism, you're not having fun. And, uh, but yeah. So, I think you want to rest me my ability to have fun. <laughs> oh man, CADing rectangular prisms. That sounds like a night on the town. Um, yeah. But yeah, make it interesting. Um, try and measure it to the best of your ability. Uh, so the cat is actually um, representative of the real life object, um, measuring tape ruler, or whatever you want, or um, maybe go with your hand measurement if you want. If you don't have a ruler on hand, one. Um, if you do, then yeah, more power to you. Uh, a protractor if you're feeling real frisky and trying to get real angles. Um, but yeah, so just CAD as accurately as you can. Um, do an assembly if you really feel like it, if it's got multiple parts to it. Uh, the assembly will actually allow you to make it like movable if it has some kind of rotational like, dynamics to it, um, like like a switch blade, if you will. If you make that multiple parts, you can actually pull out the blade and whatnot. Uh, and yeah, so just email a picture of the object to this email address here. Um, try not to spam him with any other material. <laughs> uh, just the picture of the object. Um, maybe ask him what he ate for lunch. Um, and yeah, so just go crazy with it. Um, we'll show you how to do some other cool things in Inventor. Um, that goes beyond just uh, making the CAD. So you can, of course, do a simple screenshot of your CAD and get a single view. Um, but you can also, in Inventor, render um, taking your your CAD object and running it through some kind of simulation to make a more comprehensive rendering of it. Um, you get it's a, a high quality um, textures for the imported materials, um, and really it's just it's kind of like a like a CAD flex, you know. Um, if I show up to a design review and there's a rendering of the subassembly, uh, it really conveys to me what's going on without having to like get all these different views and manually look at the the CAD. And if in the future you're trying to sell a, a product um, or convince some other party that your CAD is satisfactory, a rendering really uh, conveys that well. To do so, um, you'll first want to go off to environments. Um, this is where you're going to get probably some stuff that people don't typically use other than once you've got to the, the last mile of a project. Um, but yeah, you can choose different camera points. So if I want to move from a frontal view 
to a side view. Uh, it doesn't just do a, a static kind of slideshow type thing. It does a dynamic movement of the camera to get there. Yeah, not to be confused with Invention Studio Makerspace. Uh, this is Inventor Studio, uh, but yeah. And then once you choose to render it, um, it'll take you through the, uh, the different views, the different camera views you've set up. Um, there's all sorts of different options you can change, um, which may be specific to your setup. Most people have 1920p. Um, maybe if you're on a laptop, it's got a weird resolution. Uh, but this whatever it defaults to is probably going to be right. Um, and yeah, you can render just a single image or um, you can go crazy with this if you want as well. Uh, but yeah, the render, I will take you through a couple wizards here. Um, if you're doing a video, uh, or a video or even an image, you can give it a uh, like a time, so it should take no longer than X amount of time, because uh, you can imagine with high enough quality um, textures and a large enough assembly, uh, rendering could take quite a bit of time, um, especially dependent on the hardware you're trying to run it on. Uh, I'm not sure what rendering is going to do if you try and use it on the VLab. Because um, the VLab is virtualized um, everything, and so you're sharing GPU time with all the other instances as well. Um, but let me go at it if you're using the VLab and give it a try. <laughs> but yeah, um, once you've gotten a render that you're satisfied with, uh, you can just exit out of the wizard. And um, oh, going back to the previous slide again. Say a time or just until satisfactory. So based off of your evaluation of the render, you can stop it. Um, but yeah, based on how long you render it, <laughs> you didn't get the classes you want to run a render on the V11 Crash GT servers. Wouldn't be surprised. Uh, but yeah, um, you uh, you render your part. Um, the original um, part that you're looking at, typically when you manipulate. Um, features and whatnot, it looks very plain, but when you render it with the proper material selected and proper textures installed, you can get something that looks pretty professional. Um, and yeah, once you save it, get a little video, uh, you can play that. Um, animations in Inventor Studio. <laughs> animations in Inventor Studio. Um, there are a few of them, but you can check out uh, the video on it on our YouTube channel. Um, I believe Sam went nuts on it because he's a big fan of rendering Inventor, um, and he knows he knows a lot about it. But yeah, that's um that's the quick run through of the CAD guide. If anyone has any questions or something wasn't uh, obvious, just pop a question in the text chat or on mute and ask me. Um, otherwise, I believe we just have a single exit survey type deal of like feedback on the courses. Um, Sean, do you have that link? Because I'm not seeing it in the. Um, well, it's in the email. I'll just have to open it up. Oh, yeah. So uh, you can, as, can just open up the link in your email um, or grab it here in the, uh, in the chat. But yeah, that's really important that you guys fill that out because uh, it tells us what we're doing right, what we're doing wrong, and how we can make this better for next year. Uh, I can tell you what, when I when I started two years ago uh, as a three pounder, uh, the, the program is like night and day, you know, it's completely different. Um, and we really want this to be continually improving with each year. Um, so your feedback is really important on making it better for next year. And the link. Oh, you're, you're sending it? Yeah. Oh, sweet. So. There's the uh, reminder. You didn't have an attendance link today. Oh man. <laughs> <laughs> when oh. I was a three pounder, yeah. And then freshman 15 hit me and it was all gone from there. Um, but yeah, there's the link. Uh, otherwise, that's it for uh, this session. It's been a pleasure teaching you guys and getting uh, to know the new members. The last minute attendance link. Uh, oh, yeah, the last minute attendance link. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you guys have anything you want to say, um, anything really at all, um, but otherwise, that's it.
Thanks, guys. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you all for uh, participating in this. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you learned some useful things. You guys have some time to kill a good place for Belio. Oh, I would love to take you up on that, but I do have an exam tomorrow morning. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's that time of the year now. Yeah, it really is. Yo. Um, got a got a lab extension from Wednesday to Saturday, I think. So there's a lab. Up. Oh my gosh, man. I haven't even started it yet. Yeah, same. It's like I had a homework due on Monday, got extended to this Friday instead. I haven't <laughs> yeah. started that either. That's right. <laughs> That's what I'm talking about right now. I love it. Yeah. Oh, guys, wait for the See attendance guys. link. Yeah. I guess I guess we know it was four. So yeah, I guess yeah. <laughs> we've been obliterated by our own. Yeah, never mind. Oh, well, that, whatever. It's it's all right. Yeah. <laughs> all right. I'll see you guys. Thank you. See, see you guys. guys.